Thank you so much for coming to this panel on deportation of children and war crimes in Ukraine. My name is Janine DiGiovanni. I'm the executive director of The Reckoning Project. Along with Natalia Gumenyuk, we founded a war crimes unit inside Ukraine to investigate war crimes. War is so much more than just missiles, F-16s, and the battlefront. It's more than the military component of battle. War is about destroying the fabric of society. And at the very heart of society is the family. Mr. Putin is trying to eradicate the concept of being Ukrainian. He denies there is a Ukraine. He denies there is a Ukrainian identity. And one of the most chilling aspects of his campaign is to destroy Ukraine by stealing the children. According to the Office of the Prosecutor General, there's an estimated 19,000 Ukrainian children who have been deported or stolen to Russia. Sometimes these kids are taken falsely, their parents believing that they're going to summer camps to be safe from the fighting then the parents lose all track of them. Others have been bussed, put on trains, which is incredibly systematic, chillingly systematic, and then taken off to be adopted. There's an estimated 4,000 orphans. At The Reckoning Project, we are giving this high priority, not just documenting this terrible crime, but we're spending this year diving very deeply into the research and testimonies to try to bring these kids back home. What happens when they get to Russian territory is another chilling story. It's indoctrination. These kids have their birth certificates confiscated. Their Ukrainian names are replaced with Russian ones. They're taught Russian songs, history, lessons. The young men are sometimes taken to military training. They're brainwashed to forget Ukraine, their motherland. They're turned into Russian kids. In all my years reporting war, more than 30 years, I don't think I've come across anything so disturbing as a tactic of how to break a society. The Geneva Convention, which defines what constitutes a war crime, clearly says it's unlawful to deport civilians in times of war unless it's essential for security or imperative military reasons, and that means it's temporary. The convention also bans changing a child's family status. This illegal deportation of Ukrainian kids is a war crime, and the ICC have issued a warrant for Putin and Maria Lvova Bolova, the, the Russian Children's Rights Commissioner, for their arrest. So please welcome this incredible panel. Um, first, I'd like to start with Mr. Yevnin Meshovi, and please excuse my Ukrainian pronunciation. I am so ashamed of it, but I'm trying. He is the father of three children who were deported from Mariupol City and taken to Russia. This is Sasha, who is now eight years old. She was six when she was deported, and her dad brought her back. Uh, Galina Mikhailovuk, who is representative of the president of Ukraine in the Ukrainian parliament, and she's also a lawyer. Uh, Mr. Alexander Kolyenko, the first deputy chairman of the parliament. And Hlyb Strzyzko, <laughs> sorry, who is an incredible defender from the city of Mariupol, head of the veteran hub in Kyiv, and who was a prisoner of war. And he will be able to tell us about Putin's tactics of torture. So I'm going to start with, with Yevhen and with Sasha, and I'm wondering if you could tell us what happened. You were in a bomb shelter in Mariupol, you were evacuated from the bomb shelter, and then you were separated from your three children. The two other children are here. How did you then find out that they were taken to Russia and they were in an orphanage waiting to be adopted? 
Hello, my name is uh, Evgeny Mezhivoy. I was born in the city of Mariupol. As it was told, I am the father of three children. What happened is that when we were evacuated from the bomb shelter by force, uh, because they were said that Chechen troops are coming for us, they are not going to have mercy for anyone. So they were, we were recommended to evacuate. Well, they brought us to the blog post. They have seen that I have the military conscription registration because from 2016 to 2019 I was in the armed forces of Ukraine. They've seen this and they said, okay, here you go. So think about who you will leave your children with and now you will have to explain these documents. So this is how we are separated. The only thing I asked for is to at least put these children on the bus because uh, they had uh, heavy bags and they wouldn't have brought them on their own to the bus. The woman that I asked them to sit with my children, of course, would not be carrying those bags. In the bags, well, uh, there was food for children, so we, I couldn't uh, throw it out anywhere at that time. So this is how my children left. I was transported first uh, to one prison, then to the other. I was traveling around Donetsk Oblast. At the end, I ended up at the Yelenovska prison. I was there f for 45 days. I didn't know anything about my children, where they are, what happened, what is happening to them. There was no information at all. When I was asking the security and some of the military, how do I look for my kids, where I'm going to look for them, they said very easily where, where, whether they were uh, trans, uh, transported. There are lists, and if you call the emergency service, you will find your children. That pacified me a little bit, but not much. On the 26th of May, mm, with, uh, uh, without explaining the reasons, I was uh, called to the directorate of the prison. They said that, to not, that that night I will be set free, and I have to, back, to go back to the room and wait. So without explanation, anything. The only thing they want that I have to then show up in the city of Donetsk, get registered there, and take the documents. Um, after I was freed at 6 o'clock in the evening, the last bus from Yelenovka uh, was at uh, 5 o'clock. Probably, I think it was on purpose. So those who were leaving the prison, they were either let go at 2 o'clock at night or in the evening when the buses don't go. So many of them had to just wait on the bus stops. And we didn't do that. We decided to walk by foot. So we almost made it to Donetsk by foot. There were two of us. There was another guy who was let go with me. And we almost reached uh, Donetsk. We didn't reach the city itself because we were almost shot at. So we were at the, we met the guard post, uh, which was guarding the guard system. We decided to bypass, um, spend the night there. And then in the morning, we went to, to this registration center. I was waiting for my documents for a long time. About about six hours I had to wait and sit there. Then the woman came with big man, well, I mean really huge, two uh, meter high guy. Then so we went in this uh, registration center and they started to issue me the documents. Since all documents are ID type, the small ones, the only document the uh, big ones was the birth certificates. I uh, I saw that there were there are no birth certificates, and I asked, and where are my birth certificates? Where are the children? They said on the 27th of May, 2022, at five o'clock, they flew to Moscow. My children flew to Moscow. I said, why? Ask, well, I asked why. I said, your children have uh, lived through many bad things during the, the shelling in order to preserve their psychological condition. We are sending them, as they said, to a rehabilitation to the presidential camp. At first, I did believe that, so I wanted to believe that, that it's not as sad as it could be. My mom insisted that that's one-way ticket 
take it, I didn't want to believe that until the last uh, moment. When I asked the question, how do I get in touch with children, they said, well, this is the number of the social service of Donetsk People's Republic, and they will tell you everything. They're waiting. When I left uh, the registration center, I went. I took the first uh, the cell phone from the first soldier and, and called the social service. They explained what procedures I need to go through to give the telephone numbers of the uh, camp leaders. Uh, so. I went, I did it, I went to Novozovsk, I signed the documents where I was, I was explaining why my children were left uh, without uh, a parental care, and I was then given the number of the camp leaders. So first was the video call, I really called them, I saw the children, I was very happy, uh, was in raptures because this is the first time I saw my children, at least through video, I saw that they're alive, I saw that everything is fine, and that already inspired me a lot. I was uh, continuing the fight. Then, uh, then we uh, started talking periodically, but mostly these camp leaders would would find uh, hundreds of reasons. Either the children were busy, or there is no connectivity or anything else. So they didn't allow us to talk as much as they uh, could. But because of the Matvey, the older son, he repaired the old phone, and when Lvova Belova was coming... Yevon, could I ask you, at any point, were you believing that you were going to get the children back quickly, or was there no indication of when they would come home? Of course I believed it. These are my children. I wasn't going to give it to anyone. And uh, when uh, Lvova Belova came to visit them and they asked children what presents they want, Matvey asked for the Russian SIM card to get in touch with me, to call me. So then uh, we started calling each other. He could uh, easily call me. We would discuss. Uh, we were discussing what was happening in the camp. The boy told us that we, they were taking to the cinema. Uh, so the post-war children uh, were taken to the war to show the Second World War films. They were given them green pills of no of no known character. They had the medical commission for uh, like so many uh, tests, like four page long tests, just the list of the tests that they're just allegedly to see what their health is, but the real reasons we won't know anyway. Plus dancing parties. Dancing parties is like a voluntary slash obligatory. So the children couldn't skip them. They were made to go. If they had, uh, if they refused, then the camp leaders would uh, give an instruction to some guys from the older guys, and they would explain uh, uh, in a quite understandable manner that you have to go, you have to attend. So it was like the those who were pressing them to uh, make sure they do what they were told to. I'm going to come back to you about then how you got your children back, but I'm going to turn for a second to one of the other panelists, to Klieb. Um I'd like to ask you, you were a defender of Mariupol, and you were terribly injured when a tank shell was aimed at you. You broke your pelvis and your jaw and had other severe injuries. You were then taken to a Russian facility. Can you tell us what happened, the psychological torture, and what you endured in that time? First of all, hello to everyone. Thank you for uh, coming uh, to this uh, panel, because uh, kidnapping and stealing the children is an extremely uh, crucial thing. Ukraine as a country is doing a lot to bring them back, and this is where we need for uh, international assistance. Speaking about my experience, I got my uh, injury as a result of uh, 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 air bomb, and I was uh, basically uh, made the prisoner of war to save my life, and I thought that the condition that 
I was in, I thought that uh, wouldn't spend there long, a lot of time, that I would be transferred to Ukraine. But as soon as I were, got to the sorting station where lots of prisoners of war were brought to, the first thing they undressed me and took all the documents, all the IDs, uh, my military ticket. And uh, um, after that, uh, they took us to the hospital, and I thought that at least there I will get some kind of assistance. However, the first thing they did when they brought me to the hospital, the Russian soldier approached me, and I had a bandage that was keeping my uh, pelvis bones together. And the first thing that he simply unlocked it and uh, pulled it out, and he, and and he and he cursed. He said, "Well, you knew what you were fighting for." Now um, you have to endure the pain. So during all my days in the prison, in the imprisonment, I wasn't getting any health care. All my health, uh, medical assistance was the doctors simply would come to me. They would uh, tap me on the shoulder and say, "Well, take care. We can't do anything." So, and that's where the medical assistance would end. Uh, I wasn't t taking into account my condition. I wasn't in the the uh, prison or any penitentiary. There was only once they wanted to give me transfer to to Donetsk prison, but because of the acute condition, they refused to accept me. But even being there, on the regular basis, we were we had to listen to Russian music. They were reading out Russian propaganda because it's difficult to call it news. So we were told that Kyiv is surrounded, or that uh, fell down, and other Ukrainian big cities have have already been uh, captured, and there is uh, uh, nowhere to even uh, nothing, no one to exchange us for because such country didn't exist, they told us. And a very uh, specific feature of the Russian army is the, uh, the desire to dominate over the weak. We had six patients in the in our ward, they all couldn't stand up. We were guarded by the Russian soldiers, and when the Chechens would come to to take the guard, so they would take knives uh, and uh, basically touch uh, touch uh, with those knives our bodies and say they want to kill us as sheep. Well, it was the signal of the end of the air raid uh, alarm in Kiev. He said that's now it's it's better in Kiev. So. They were psychologically pressurizing us and also a moral uh, pressure because also um, the Russian journalists would also come and uh, the worst condition was the better it was for, for, the, for the news. And this is how my friends uh, found out I was in prison because there was no connection with me since the 29th of March and in one of the many groups uh, that Russians were Russians created where they were putting up, posting the pictures of the prisoners of war. My friends and family saw me, they saw my condition, and this is my way back home started. Also, you, you couldn't move when you were in bed because you had a broken jaw, you couldn't eat, and the nurses wouldn't help you with the food. You gave a testimony that they would leave the food and they couldn't help you get it. So then they would come and take the food away from you. So there were all kinds of these cruel psychological um, games that they were playing as well. Um, did you, when you were there, did you have any sense of what they want? What does Putin want? What, what, do, what do the Russians want? Uh, obviously, I don't have this information, but uh, uh, yes, uh, I was thinking about what the president of the Gresh's country wants, but uh, there was a feeling that all those who were wounded uh, and who were at the hospital, we thought that they want to break their spirit. Our bodies were uh, broken already. Uh, and. Uh, 
basically uh, well maybe they would hit us additionally or there would be some physical interaction uh, probably we wouldn't feel worse but uh, uh, every Ukrainian warrior has this spirit the spirit of a warrior and they wanted to break that and they were doing everything for that basically while in prison uh, while in capture I thought about genocide of the Soviet power in the 30s in Ukraine, that was uh, the uh, hunger, and when I could feel it, and uh, then Holodomor, the starvation that my ancestors survived through, uh, meant something different for me. And when my uh, comrades in arms wanted to feed me or give me water, they were not allowed to do so, so that we are just there and we uh, just... Kalina, you're a lawyer and you're also in the parliament. Can you give us the context of all of these war crimes? The Office of the Prosecutor General says there are 123,000 recorded incidents. That's recorded. We have no idea how many more incidents will be reported when the occupied areas are liberated. Can you take us through what's happening from parliament? Dear ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this uh, incredible uh, panel and for everyone present here for your interest and for the willingness to help Ukraine. True, I'm deputy head of the Law Enforcement Committee and from the very first day of uh, uh, the second wave of the full-scale uh, war in Ukraine, uh, um, our committee was extremely busy with adopting amendments to legislation, to the criminal court, to the criminal procedure code, because we needed to, to, to put additional powers, uh, to grant additional powers to the prosecutors, to the policemen, because uh, um, in, in one morning, uh, the life of the country was completely changed. Uh, within the first year, within uh, 2022, um, my committee was in top three, the busiest committees in the parliament, and we have adopted more than 95 laws that amends uh, the criminal code and criminal procedure code and uh, penalizes certain acts that were previously um, not considered as a wrongdoing. Actually, um, when Irpin was uh, uh, liberated, uh, um, the third day um, the committee had a, a meeting there with the general prosecutor, with the prosecutor from International Criminal Court. So step by step, we actually um, we've asked prosecutors of what particular changes to legislation you need to make your work effective. Because the decision was taken that we will not wait till the end of the war to start collecting the evidences. The evidences were collected from the very first hour when um, the territories were liberated. That's why yeah, um, it was a ping pong between uh, uh, the prosecutor's office, uh, law enforcement committee, and also international criminal court, because we, 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 we as legislators, we did our best to ensure that our legislation, uh, criminal law legislation, criminal procedural law legislation, is um, effective enough so that prosecutors can act quickly and policemen to collect all the evidence that will be admitted afterwards in uh, international courts. Um, that's why yeah, um, that was highly important for us. And uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, we have uh, very good cooperation with International Criminal Court. Um, uh, we had a number of personal meetings, visits, and uh, uh, we, we have recommendations and advice with them how to proceed. And uh, uh, I do hope that on that moment we did our best. Myself, personally, I am uh, the first author of the draft law uh, 9204 that deals with actually 
uh, deportation, penalization uh, for uh, deportation of, uh, um, of people. And uh, the second uh, provision there is actually about the deportation of children. So uh, it has successfully passed uh, the first reading in the committee and waiting to be considered in the plenary session. And um, in the law enforcement committee, I also am in charge of international cooperation. That's why on all possible international platforms we discuss uh, um, and we ask for our international partners uh, to help us uh, um, to join the coalition in order to have uh, our uh, children and uh, um, um, Ukrainian civilian, civilians uh, back home as soon as possible. You are right that we have already more than 123,000 of war crimes and crimes against aggression registered. Um, unfortunately, the estimates of ombudsman that we have more than 700 thousand of kids being deported from the territory of Ukraine. Only 1,956 cases are officially like registered, documented, and uh, um, around 4,000 of them are orphans. And that means that uh, if we will do our best to get every single day at least one kid back to Ukraine, it will take us 55 years to get them back. Um, this is, statistics is horrible. And uh, every single case of bringing kids back to Ukraine is a special operation. We have already, um, as of uh, yesterday, um, 517 kids back um, um, to their families to Ukraine. Uh, we are very much grateful to our partners like Qatar, who helped us a number of times in negotiations with uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia, because uh, as you know, uh, we do not have jurisdiction in Russia, and only thanks to our international partners we can negotiate, we can ask, and we can do our best um, to have them back as soon as possible. Thank you, Galina. Alexander, this, of course, is genocidal intent, trying to take children, turn them into Russian kids, make them forget that they're Ukrainian, take away their names and their birth certificates. What is, do you see behind all of this? And do you think, um, do you think it is genocide? It's a very high international, in terms of international law, it's a very high bar. And usually it, it, is, it is the crime that tends to be avoided because there are so many other crimes. There's deportation, there's torture, there's sexual violence. But can you talk a bit from your perspective as a parliamentarian about thank genocide? You, uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. Thank you for your attention for this topic. But um, unfortunately for me, it's not a good sign that uh, uh, most of this room can hear our brilliant speakers on Ukrainian without translation. For me, it's a sign that uh, we once more discuss with Ukrainian society about this issue. But we need more discussion about this issue in non-Ukrainian language society. It's not to, to, to it's not some pretension to organizers, it's some uh, pretension to, to, to all over the world. Because for, for my feeling, for these two years, it's one of the more dramatic but uh, uh, no, no, not so um, kind uh, issue about Ukrainian and Russian war. It's something that, that we need uh, to, to, to hidden. And, and it issues that we need to, to, to be more, more far from that. Why? I don't know. We need to, to return uh, attention and uh, very precision attention to this, all this issue. We know that one, one of the part of this problem is problem of uh, establishing of special war crime tribunal. Of course, uh, we have very deep and very hard discussion with international partners about it. Uh, we all we understand and know all uh, problems that are going with this issue and why 
it uh, can be established uh, right now and why it may be possible in the future, etc., etc., etc. But we need to, to keep attention to, to this issue. What about genocide? I'm not a lawyer, I'm a politician from other sphere, but uh, I know that uh, we have strong international papers in what uh, very wise people before us uh, 50 years ago put something. Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, Article 2, Point E, Forcible Transferring Children of the Group of to Another People. It one of the uh, part of uh, recognizing something like genocide. It's very clear. Yeah. You don't need uh, to, to build some, uh, I don't know, some difficult construction. You need to understand it. Deportation, uh, even uh, one Ukrainian children, it's part of genocide. But deportation, thousands of Ukrainian people, of course, it's part of genocide. And the indoctrination of them when they get to Russia, how, they, how they're stripped of their identity. Uh, of course, uh, you know, um, all uh, big uh, empires, when, when they um, did the big uh, imperialistic war, did the same. Because uh, um, it's not so uh, simple task to uh, punish all nation. You need to be, in bad, in bad sense, creative. You need to catch children, you need to, to do something with them, to, to change the identity, you need to use propaganda, you need to use different propaganda, you need to use propaganda on the land with very uh, simple tasks to people. It's, something, it, it's not something difficult, it's about to pay pension uh, in uh, occupied territory, something bigger than pension in uh, Ukrainian village uh, on, on the other uh, side of battlefield. And, and people start to talk about and, uh, okay, uh, it's, it's not bad to live uh, uh, under occupation because we have something bigger, big, 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 biggest pay. In uh, deportation of children, unfortunately, what, what uh, we recognize it uh, from the first day of this process, we recognize that Russia used some uh, optimistic rhetoric about it. And they use this optimistic rhetoric to uh, communicate it, to promote it uh, to the world. They say to the world, like Maria Belova and other speakers, who top speakers of this issue, they say, uh, all children are safety, they're in very good condition, they're in special presidential camp, not unusual, in presidential. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That's they have discotheques every, disco every, every evening, yeah? The language is absolutely, very Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's language of, of uh, it's not language of tortures. and language of some attitude, of some good attitude. Uh, we try to, to, to make uh, their lives better. We need to yeah we need to to build some uh, some uh, strategy to to f to fight with that. Uh, of course, unfortunately, while we can't um, uh, talk in most more practical about special war crime tribunal, we need to use different international. Uh, area for, for, to promote it. Our, for example, our delegation to Parliament Assembly Council of Europe here, uh, Maria and uh, Elena, uh, Lesia Vasilenka, they, they promoted uh, the Burana, Lesia, they, they promoted this idea in uh, PASE, and uh, PASE uh, established a special ad hoc committee to, to, to investigate it. What is it, PASE? Parliament Assembly of more than 60 countries, from Europe, not from Europe. It's a good possibility to promote it. It's a good possibility to uh, give uh, sense to that. Uh, for example, on last uh, uh, assembly of interparliamentary union in Angola, we, we make, uh, made an uh, exhibition of uh, children, uh, of, about deportation, de deported children, about war crimes, about children, with some special children uh, uh, drawing what they did about war and about the situation. We need to use all uh, possibility to, to keep uh, attention to this issue. 
Thank you. I'd like to go to Mr. Um, Mikolaev Kuleva from Save Ukraine. Thank you for the excellent work you do. At the Reckoning Project, we're hoping to work together with you on this year-long project to try to bring back the kids. You've done really exceptional work, and you've been very involved in actually bringing the children back. Can you talk a little bit about this? And also, Galina said, with the statistics, it will take 65 years to bring all of these kids back. Is there a way that we can hasten this? Because this is the next generation of Ukraine. This is Ukraine's future. Thank you so much for highlighting these issues. It is so important because it's about the future of our country. I'm always telling that it's this war on women and children just to erase the identity, just to kill Ukrainian population and totally destroy our country. And Putin clearly understands this and build a strategy to forcibly deport these kids, to re-indoctrinate re them, brainwash, and um, to to clean identity, to convert them, to turn to Russians. And very often people ask me, especially journalists, why Putin needs children. It's clear because... The to future. Yeah, it's our future. Killing your future. Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. And um, another thing, it's they have a huge demographic issues. Yeah, it's if Ukrainian territory 13 times less than Russian, and we have, um, they have populations three times more than Ukrainians. They have th thousands of kilometers territories without people. And what our families and children reporting us, just, just before my trip here, we rescued one 12 years old child with a mother. The, they've been very close to combat zones where are Russians. they totally destroying everything there. They're killing people. When they were walking through a battlefields, Russian tried to kill them, and they told me that they've seen a lot of dead bodies there. Because a life for Russians is nothing. It's nothing. And it's, it's hard to believe what our kids experience in there. How huge trauma! It is generational trauma. Yeah. Yeah, and um, but I want to point a little your attention on another number of kids. We were talking about twenty thousand who've been forcibly deported. We really don't know how many. Yeah. It's just official number. We've been talking. Galina told about more than seven hundred thousand who've been registered in Russia. Yeah, after full-scale invasion happened. But we have to talk about 1.5 million children who stay in after 2014 uh, in Donbass, Crimea, new occupied territories, and in Russia. It is how many of them unaccompanied, we don't know. It could be dozens of thousands. But all of them under huge indoctrination. Many, we can see this, this young soldier and we have no idea how many young adults now dying as the Russian soldiers who've been school children in Donbass, Crimea, who've been brainwashed, indoctrinated, and now they believe that fighting against NATO, against Nazi, yeah, it's, it's thousands of Ukrainian children who've been brainwashed now dying. What for? What for? For Russian empire? For Putin's idea? Can I ask you, um, I don't know if it, maybe you will not be able to talk about it, but when I was in Kyiv a few weeks ago, Save Ukraine, working with UNICEF and Qatar, helped bring six kids back, I think, the day I was, when I was there. Can you talk about how that works, or is it too uh, secretive? It's, it, it is confidential. Qatar helping Ukraine with this negotiation, return kids. We, I, I, 
represents NGO and we are working with parliament members, with the presidential office, with ombudsman office, with everybody who can help and to find relatives, to return these children. And uh, huh. it's very often people are asking, how are you doing this? Because it's almost impossible to take anybody from there. Um, can you activate Russian activists inside Russia who help um, you? Or you can't say that? I can't say okay. this. Okay. Yeah, but I understand. sometimes, one thing I, I will inform you, sometimes we kidnap children back because Russians don't want even to go from the facility, go out from the facility. Our children are hostages there. They've been captured and they've been informed from the first day that you will stay, stay here in Russia for whole your life. You must forget Ukraine. You must erase Ukraine from your minds. You will be Russian children. You should be proud. You should remember who fit in you. It's very aggressively. It's our kids received a lot of traumas through yeah. this. It's not only singing Russian anthem or doing something. It's, it's like to be captured and live around, uh, er, surrounded of enemies. And erasing their memories and erasing their identity. But you know, I, I want to tell you one thing. That kids who've been returned, I ask them, what was the most emotional for you? They, they crossed the Ukrainian border, then they've seen Ukrainian flag, and many of them were crying. Wow. I, I see the father yeah. now is... I'm going to ask them to understand. tell how they Yes, it's very emotional to be on your own land. It's Israel. I ask them, how you save your Ukrainian identity there? Identity there? And they told, we felt that we will never turn to Russians. We want to stay Ukrainians. We believe that we will come back. And one 12 years old boy told me, when I asked him, did you believe? He told, yeah, I plan my escape. 12 years old boy. And I told, how you plan it? I, I couldn't sleep at night and all time I was thinking and I plan how we cross the border, front line, but only one thing stopped me. I did not know how to cross minefields. I was planning cross minefields. Ukrainian 12 years old boy who was dreaming escape and come back to Ukraine. He's in Ukraine now, thank God. And we have to return these kids. And this war will continue until every Ukrainian child be able to come back. Thank you so much, and thank you thank for you. the work you do at Save Ukraine. Um, I do want to open up to the audience for questions and comments, but I just want to come back to Yevon and Sasha, and picking up from where Mr. Kuleba left off, when you got your kids back, can she, do you want, can she speak, or I, I don't want to put her through this, actually, you know, of a kid, but maybe you can tell us. Do you want to talk? Yes, she does, okay. Do you remember what it was like in Russia? Do you remember what it was like when you were in Russia at all? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, just don't force her, it's okay. Don't. But I'd like you to tell me, Yevon, what, when, you, when the children came back to you, how had they changed? Did they tell you about what happened to them there? What did you notice as a dad? What had changed? Obviously they were traumatized, but what, what was different? 
uh, what was different uh, it was it's about my uh, middle daughter she's more uh, connected to me Sasha is just running around but Svata is my daughter she goes somewhere with the dad and that's what uh, now when uh, she hears some uh, loud sounds, uh, fireworks sometimes, or some loud music. Uh, well, uh, for her, it's like a nightmare. She hides herself under the blanket, she cries, and awful things are happening to her. At night, they are crying, they're shouting, and that's true about all children. Matvei talks at night, Svata as well, and Sasha. But um, otherwise, I haven't seen any other changes. Uh, some uh, changes uh, related to age, yes, there were, but nothing else. What else can I tell? Uh, that's thanks to Matvei. He helped me return them home because he did a lot for that. Uh, he was taking care of girls in the camp uh, and they were putting them on different uh, floors. One floor was for girls, another one for boys and he agreed, uh, he, he made it so that girls were put on a different floor with him. He was like a father for, for them. And he was educating them instead of me in Russian camp. Thank you. Um, I think if we could have just short closing arguments about where do we go from here? How do we continue? Do we keep documenting? Um, one encouraging thing is I don't think I've ever seen so much documentation of these war crimes. And what you said, Galina, not waiting until the war is over, but doing it while the war is raging because this hastens the process. Otherwise, we fall into the trap of international justice where it takes years, sometimes decades. Um, we always talk about at the Reckoning Project the case of Syria, where, which was a, a very heavily documented war. Everyone had an iPhone, so they took pictures of Putin's bombs in Aleppo, but they weren't verified at the same time, and there is such a scale an enormous amount of video now sitting in an office at the United Nations in Geneva. And Ukraine is in a very much more advantageous place in terms of the documentation. But where do you see us going from here? And then I want to come back to Glib and just um, ask you about the other veterans and how there can be some kind of healing when the war does end. So maybe Galina, then Glib, then Alexander. So actually, if you want to help Ukraine, everyone can do it. If you are even outside of Ukraine, if you are a representative of other country, you can actually ask uh, your embassies or representative offices of your state in Russian Federation to help to track Ukrainian kids on the territory of Russian Federation, to give us information, any kind of information on what's their location, what's their state of health, whereabouts. Secondly, you can also, uh, um, uh, as a foreign state, you can impose sanctions on those who are dealing actually with the kids' kidnapping. And uh, for us, it's highly important uh, also uh, to have uh, mediators, international mediators, when we talk about uh, negotiations between Ukraine and Russia on bringing our kids back. So everyone can volunteer to become this mediator and to facilitate, to increase uh, uh, the numbers of uh, Ukrainian kids being b back home to Ukraine. And what is more important that uh, um, number of times uh, when we talk about bringing kids back to Ukraine or bringing Ukrainian like you know adults um, citizens of Ukraine back um, third countries presented their platform of being uh, um, the hosting country for the exchange so uh, any country any representative uh, of uh, a foreign state can also serve uh, uh, to negotiate in this way what is 
highly important is that uh, bringing kids back to Ukraine is uh, uh, provided in the first point of the President Volodymyr Zelensky peace formula. That was it was discussed uh, uh, during the Malta peace formula summit in October last year, and actually more than 66 representatives of uh, foreign states agreed on that. And as a result of that uh, Malta summit, uh, there was an international coalition of states formed, and actually nowadays there are more than 72 representatives of states and international organizations who are dealing with the returning Ukrainian kids back. Um, here we have Qatar, Canada, the US, the UK, OCE, UNICEF, you know, a number of uh, countries and international organizations. And um, this uh, uh, international coalition dealing with practical steps uh, of, uh, um, of and, 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 and uh, discussing the documents uh, um, on how to make the return of children, you know, um, as quick as possible. And what's the, the second track that is uh, being discussed now in Ukraine and uh, how we proceed is that we formed the Bring Kids Back to, to Ukraine uh, International um, Task Force. The first meeting was uh, last week in Kiev that was led by uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky and actually the international coalition will use the materials that will be uh, elaborated uh, and developed by this international task force to proceed. Thank you. Leave. Can do we know how many prisoners of war, Ukrainian prisoners of war, are in Russia? And is there anything, what is being done to bring them back? Uh, probably no one can tell you what's the exact number. It's difficult to talk uh, about that for me because uh, it's about my friends who are still there in uh, imprisonment and I am sitting here in comfortable Switzerland. And what is very important, it's in the Ukrainian society, in world society, we need to remember that and we need to remind about that because many people in Ukraine even ask whether it's worth going to events which are related to return of uh, prisoners of war, whether that uh, will affect uh, the situation. If we don't do that, they will be forgotten. But we have no right uh, to do that because those who did maximum for this state to exist, we cannot allow um, people to forget about them. And when we are talking about kidnapping, basically kidnapping uh, children from uh, Ukraine and also when we are talking about the prisoners of war, and there are many civilian hostages. I trust my state in that. We have a coordination headquarters that's uh, returning the prisoners of war, uh, not in the numbers that I would like to see, because last year just two of my friends from my uh, unit returned, uh, and I have some note uh, in uh, my telephone. I uh, communicate with of those who survived, uh, and uh, I would like to have plus and uh, the date when the person was returned next to every name in this note. And for me, it's very important to come to the events where people remind that there are too many people still in imprisonment, uh, and I ask you to do the same. It's very easy, but it's very important. And uh, that could be your uh, uh, contribution to the victory. Thank you for your service and all you've, you've done and all you've gone through. Um, Alexander, a quick, very quick wrap-up, because then I would like to see if, if, if there's comments from... Oh, from I the... have only one, one message, maybe, about uh, why it's so important uh, to establish justice after after war or in time of war. It's, uh, it's so important like uh, to give Ukrainian right now even. It's so important to give uh, justice to, to Ukraine uh, also right now. Uh, if uh, Western world, our allies, uh, will not give weapon enough quantity to us, we uh, will not win. And we know what will be. 
uh, Russia will try to, to fight with Europe, maybe with Baltic countries, and with Poland, etc. Et but if we will not establish uh, right um, structures and mechanisms of uh, responsibility of Russia in terms of war criminals, uh, it will be open uh, Pandora box to all of Socrates all over the world to make torches all over the world. In Korea, in Iran, in etc., and anywhere, all over the world. Because uh, one of the democratic mechanics is responsibility and is justice. That's why we need to promote it and we need to talk about it in, in one line uh, of, after coma, uh, after weapon. Weapon and responsibility. F-16 and Special War Crime Tribunal. 155 uh, shells and uh, bring our kids back as soon as it possible. Uh, and, we will, <laughs> and we will talk about it next year, this year, uh, all as, as it will be need. And uh, with all our soul and inspiration from our brave guys from Battlefield and from our families from occupied territory who, who was tortured by Russia. Thank you. I'd like to see, um, it, does anyone have a comment or a question for one of the panelists? Something you'd like to bring up? Um, anyone? And I think one thing I, I do want to say, and it was something that was brought up last night at the Ukrainian dinner, Ukraine, it's so important for the international community to continue to support Ukraine in every way, with everything you need. Even if President Trump does win in America, we have to find a way to keep the focus on Ukraine. Because Ukraine, it's more, it's more than just the fight for Ukraine. If Putin is allowed to win, then he will not stop with Ukraine. It, he will go to other places. And that's true also of justice. We have to set a precedent in Ukraine for international justice, that these kind of crimes will not go on without accountability. So people have to be held accountable. Nations have to be held accountable. And that's why justice is so important right now for Ukraine. So thank you, all thank of you. you, for everything you've done, your extraordinary work. Thank you for your service. Um, oh, sorry, it's, it's not a question. Maybe, friends, Come. on on the very last uh, practical thing, uh, Maria Mazin, so a member of parliament, head of delegation in the Council of Europe. We have an organization who's been doing a sometimes okay, sometimes great job in its capacity with the most long-lasting historical mandate, and this is the International Committee of the Red Cross. Yeah. Everybody knows across the world what this organization is for. I want to call everyone in this room and everyone who might be seeing your posts in social media. Look, okay, they could not reach out to the temporary occupied areas for the prisoners of war, who our honorable panelist was. But they can reach out to the sovereign territory of Russia. They can go to the camps in Moscow, camps, camps in St. Petersburg, Rostov on Don when they have opened an office in 2022. They can do that. And they have promised to do that. I think they should because the investments are flowing. The mandate is there. If they would need the help, we can, you know, cooperate with others who can travel. We can't. We are in the kill list and under two packages of sanctions. But they have to act. You know Otherwise, they're here. Mariana, of the course, is here. We, so you we, should... we cooperate, we communicate, but I think we're trying sometimes to invent a bicycle in international law. Well, there is already a mechanism. And of course, finding a proper international law mechanism for prisoners of war, for civilians who are missing, like my relative and my family, like those 20,000 children unknown number who went deported. How can you imagine a four-year-old would ever call on a video call to their parents if, for instance, they have, don't have a, an older brother together? Yeah. They forget, they, they are broken, they are in a terrible state. We have to act, friends, this is not a joke. 
Otherwise, they will make them fight, like they wanted to do with the recent boy turning 18 on his birthday coming to, back home to Ukraine, because he recorded the video, he addressed the President Zelensky, he addressed the NGOs. Many of them just cannot do that. So we don't want these children to fight in the Russian army against us. That would be a collapse. Please, let's prevent that. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, I'm Elena Komenko, uh, the Member of Parliament, and I'm chairing the committee. Uh, our Vice Speaker just mentioned uh, the special committee that was established in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and uh, we will be dealing and we will be looking for uh, instruments and mechanisms to uh, return our children back, all, all the children. And we need a lot of support. And we, uh, it's a different kind of support. And when we call on you, we call on our partners to get engaged and uh, we are welcoming you to cooperate with us uh, uh, under auspice of uh, this platform in the PACE, under auspice of the special ad hoc committee on Ukrainian children. Thank you very much, dear, dear colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for coming and thank, thank you. you again to our, our wonderful panel. Thank you.